So uh, next Thank we you. have uh, Shlomit uh, Becker from Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine, who will be talking about oscillatory processes in autism spectrum disorder. Take it away, Shlomit. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me just, um, okay, can you see it now? Okay, so thanks for uh, joining this Zoom. And um, I'm Shlomit Becker and I'm working in the Cognitive uh, Neurophysiology Lab in uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. And um, I'm working on uh, predictive processing in autism. And I'd like to show you some data, but um, moreover, I would like us to discuss uh, predictive processing in the broader sense of um, cognitive or neurodevelopmental disorders and uh, how we can measure it in the brain. So um, I'll start with showing you the data and then the discussion. <clears throat> so information in the Just environment. Just to interrupt you quickly, uh, are you sharing we are oh. able to see the entire screen of your. Sorry. It sounded. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, you can just uh, like. Yes, I have. I have two screens. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I always have a problem with it. Let me just uh, reshare. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for letting me know. Um. Sorry, just a second. How is it now? Yep, perfect. Is it moving between the yes. lines and everything? Okay. So information in the environment is usually normally uh, highly predictive of um, of upcoming events and the ability to anticipate relevant events is uh, advantages for adaptive behavior. Temporal expectations are necessary for dynamic cognitive control. Um, in autism, so autism is neurodevelopmental condition that affects social communication. Individuals with autism, um, we know from the literature that they show deficits in using cues to generate expectation. And the phenomenology of ASD includes rigid cuprodine, of routines, uh, insistence and sameness, inflexibility, and altered use of prior knowledge. The rigidity um, is inability to mentally adapt to uh, new demands or information. And a good example for uh, how people with autism are, uh, have high rigidity comes from uh, visual illusions. So uh, for example, here we perceive this triangle, okay? Although it's not like, explicitly outlined. Uh, so people with, with autism will not perceive this or will be less uh, susceptible to this illusion as well as to other illusions. So the general aim of the following studies that I'm gonna uh, show you result from um, is to test possible neuronal mechanisms that are involved in altered prediction and rigidity. In the first one, uh, we did it on children. Uh, we had uh, 31 uh, kids between the ages of six to nine years old. Uh, we measured EEG from them and we showed them uh, the task that includes four consecutive visual figures followed by an auditory cue to which they responded. Uh, all these visual and auditory um, stimuli were equally spaced with 60, um, uh, sorry, 650 uh, milliseconds between them. So uh, while there was no difference in the uh, evoked sensory response, not in the visual and not in the auditory uh, between the typically developed and the uh, ASD kids and the autism kids, there was a significant difference in the anticipatory activity. So if you can see here, there is a nicely gradated pattern that uh, starts from the first, second, third, and fourth so there were four, right? Four consecutive uh, stimuli in the pattern. So it, with each one, uh, the signal was uh, was lower. Uh, and this is a clear indication for contingent negative variation or CNV, which is um, an indication for anticipatory processing. Um, this indication was uh, absent from the children with ASD. 
Then um, we need to know how entrained they are or how entrained their um, low, their uh, slow oscillations are to this rhythm of presentation. So we just local filter the signal as you can see here. So black is the CD and the pink is the ASD. And we can see here that the ASD are not as aligned to the rhythm of the uh, stimuli as the CD. We can see it also here in phase concentration. So kids with autism do not track normally these uh, stimuli. Eventually, um, again from from the same uh, from from the same study on children, we can see that they had low intertrial phase coherence. So just to illustrate you what phase coherence is, if we plot one over one on top of the other their individual um, trials, we can see that, for example, here on the left, for the, this TP T, sorry TD participant, they are very aligned. The phases are very aligned. For this ASD kid, uh, it's not well aligned. So anyway, there was a significant difference of the IPPC between these two populations. And what's more interesting is that those mostly significant areas were prior to the time here in the dashed white lines, time of stimulus presentation. So this was the next indication uh, that they had lower um, or altered predictive processing. Uh, we've just uh, received very similar results from um, similar. Let me sorry to interrupt you. I think uh, we are running out of time. Okay, so just the last last uh, two slides yeah. um, from adults. We saw the same uh, very very similar pattern. So higher uh, IPPC for the TD and lower IPPC for the ASD. And just one very small thing uh, that we find very uh, compelling is that in a jitter paradigm, so that the times of the stimuli is not fixed, it is jitter in a small window, we see that while the TDs in black have a tendency to follow this rhythm, even though it is jitter, those um, ASD people do not. So we interpret it as they, they are more rigid. Um, I'll skip this. I'll and I'll get to this. Um, the point of discussion is, for me, I mean, unless you have other questions, is, is impaired prediction, susceptibility, unique feature of autism, and how specific are impaired oscillatory activity um, in general or for autism. So, yeah. All right. Thank you for the excellent talk. Um, we are waiting for questions from the attendees. And uh, in the meantime, so I'm going to ask you the same question as I asked uh, Hager, like how difficult is it to get these recordings from these, uh, like in this particular population? Because we have tried, uh, uh, we, we thought of doing EEG experiments in my previous lab. I mean, it was not me, but a colleague of mine, but mm -hmm. we ended up doing sleep recordings because that's the best possible oh. way we can get. So yeah, and EEG, as you know, I mean, it has its own set of artifacts that's related to movement and other things. So yeah, so definitely cleaning and uh, cleaning the data is a major step, especially from kids and especially from kids with autism, which are you know not always uh, stay still. Um, but I can tell you, so first, yeah, it takes a lot of cleaning and also we just had to uh, discard some of the participants for noisy data. What's very interesting and this comes from another set of data that uh, we're now working on, they're very very consistent in their uh, pattern of activity. So EEG is very very consistent even across time. So once you overcome this noise, this external noise, um, we find that the results are pretty strong and uh, pretty reliable. Well, Hedrin, why don't you just unmute yourself and ask the question? You touched on this, but this is something I've been interested in. In neuroimaging, there are a lot of different ways that we assess quality of scan. Um, and I wonder for EEG, like, is there any uh, quality control procedure to ensure that um, certain recordings are useful or are they just kind of discarded if they have any bit of noise? 
Um, so let me just repeat your question to, under, to say that I understood it correctly. You're asking if we have any way to control that the EEG, so that, for example, they, they were looking at the screen and stuff like that? Or just assessments of the quality of the EEG, like what is, what is a process? Because like you said, there is noisy data, okay. but that, you know, noisy data is all thrown out or are there procedures that can help with self- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there are, we have a, like uh, each data set is going through a pipeline of uh, cleaning and um, it's based both on trial by trial and, and also on uh, channels. So we interpolate it bit channels and we replace them with an average of the neighboring channels. For example, this is one way to do it. Um, we throw trials with more than X bad channels um we discard trials with um i don't know like voltage that cross some threshold there is yeah there is a like a set of criteria to decide what are you know what bad, bad data is and it's slightly different from kids to adults because they have an inherent you know like a higher baseline noise There's one question in the chat box. Yeah. So uh, we have a question from Emma, who, who doesn't want to come on screen. That's fine. Um, hi, Shlomit, thanks for your talk. Um, she says, uh, we know from other tos tasks that uh, kids with autism can and do make predictions. Example, Kathy Manning's work. So this is interesting to hear. I'm curious if you integrate the hierarchical nature of predictive processing into any of the tasks to look at and not only look at uh, simple predictions, but prediction errors and precision rating. I'm reading, I'm reading the question, just a second. Errors and precision rating. Not yet, <laughs> that's the simple uh, answer. Um, so I, I can just say that predictive processing might not be the perfect title or name for this kind of project, of, of this project that I showed you. I think that uh, the, the most, sorry, more appropriate name would be uh, predictive timing, because we're not dealing with contents of predictions, we're deal which is some other projects that are being uh, done in our lab. But I'm mostly interested in whether they can predict the timing of events. So uh, there are like, different models and different paradigms that we do to, to measure the predicting timing, predictive timing. So uh, there's one more question asking about, um, in addition to ITC, have you looked at phase synchronization between the presented stimuli and EEG response, like people do in auditory research? I wonder if something like this is possible for visual stimuli. So uh, we do have an auditory module for the last uh, study that I showed you on an adult. Um, I'm not sure I understand your, if, 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 if you can, um, I don't know, like explain what you mean by it. Do you want so to come on screen? I just show you phase concentration in this data and also ITPC but um, maybe you can explain what you mean. Um, do you want to come on screen? If you just let us know in chat, we can probably bring you on screen. Oh, he's just writing it down, okay. Um, if I understand correctly, what he means is, um, if we look at the phase synchronization between the presented stimuli and the response, and not only between or within, sorry, the response itself, um, that is, I guess, what he means. So we did the phase concentration, which kind of aligned or measured the alignment of the, of the EEG to the timing of presentation. That is the most closer to what uh, what you suggest here, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll definitely look it up. Um, so waiting for, we have one more minute. Uh, I have a quick question about uh, 
the comparison that you showed in the uh, evoke potentials, it like after each stimuli, it seemed there was a negativity or was it actually, it started high and started going down, right? So the- You're talking about this. Yes, this one, yeah. Yeah. But the for the TD group, for the ASD group, it seems it's at the same level as almost the fourth, right? It, that is not that initial increase or like the higher positivity. Uh, do you know? Do you have any idea why? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with you. So um, first, I just want to say that uh, that the waveform or how it looks really depends on the place that you measure it from. So the or okay. and also the electrode that you uh, reference, right? The other yeah. channel too. So this could be different. And yes, you are right that the whole waveform is different for the ASD than the TD. And they start off with just a lower um, lower voltage. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. So, but overall, for example, here in the TD, we found it, uh, a significant difference between the first and the fourth uh, responses. And here we didn't find any response. It's like the okay, same. Got it. You're right that the baseline response to the first stimulus is also in a different voltage. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, thanks again. Um, uh, so I can probably.